Good afternoon, and welcome to another Moment with Madison. The federal government was, as Patrick Henry put it, on a bad footing. Here, we were in agreement. We had had hoped that the end of the war would alleviate our problems. Quite to the contrary, now that we no longer had the protection of the British Navy, our merchant marine was subject to horrendous preditions. Ships were captured, cargo seized, men kidnapped. Added to this was a general European refusal to extend credit to our merchants. It was specie, gold and silver, or nothing. Congress's attempt at pretty money were a farce. No one would accept continentals. Even the states required that taxes be paid in specie. Our economy was a disaster, and things were getting worse. In March of 1783, a number of senior army officers met in Newburgh to voice their complaints to Congress about their failure to be paid. It was feared that this was the beginning of a coup d'etat. The officers met in a secret meeting on the evening of the 15th to discuss George Washington walked into the room unannounced. He appealed to them for patience. At one point, he had to reach into his pocket and take out his spectacles in order to read his notes. And his officers cried to see their beloved commander so aged. They swore their loyalty. In June, a rabble of soldiers descended upon Congress in Philadelphia, also demanding to be paid. The president of Pennsylvania, John Dickinson, declined to send out the militia, and Congress was forced to flee to Princeton. John Dickinson, remember him, the penman of the revolution? He's the one they should have been protesting. Congress approved the army pay. The states just didn't send in their contributions. On top of this, the loyalists who had fled to Nova Scotia wanted to be reimbursed for their property. Just because they left doesn't mean they don't still own their property. Some patriots disagreed. We beat them in battle, we get to take their stuff, right? Wrong. Alexander Hamilton made a ton of money defending the rights of exiled loyalists. The states were also having difficulty in deciding which states had control of which waterways. A convention was called in Annapolis in the spring of 1786. Five states showed. We were depressed. All but Hamilton. For him, this was our clarion call. This proved that we needed to write a new constitution that would bind all 13 states into a single nation. He called on Congress to approve such a convention. Congress declined. I took my young friend aside, he was 29 years old, and suggested he modify his proposal to um, address the deficits in the Articles of Confederation. This Congress could abide. Now all we had to do was get representatives from all 13 states. There was only one thing that would get them all to come. George Washington. George Washington, however, did not think so. He had done his duty, he was happily retired, he saw no reason to risk his reputation on so dubious an enterprise. Upon further discussion, I was able to ascertain that if we were able to get all 13 states to send delegations, then he would be interested in attending. This is all I needed. I proceeded to talk to all of the representatives, explaining to them how important it was that they come, how much George Washington expected them to show, how much they needed to be in the room where it happens. <laughs> About this time, a member of farmers in Western Massachusetts became incensed at the courts for foreclosing on their properties for taxes, 
while the government was providing no actual money for them to pay their taxes with. These men were not lazy. They were diligent, loyal patriots. They had fought and died in the revolution, and they were being cheated by their own government. Captain Daniel Shays and the others descended upon the course and shut them down. We were horrified. Anarchy, death, and destruction seemed imminent. Washington, Adams, Hamilton, myself, and others were convinced that we were traitors of the worst sort. In later years, several of us have looked back upon Shay's Rebellion with different eyes. As it was, it provided impetus to the convention. We convinced 12 states to send delegations, only Rhode Island abstained. George Washington committed to the project and we were golden. Now all we needed to do was to unify two and a half million people in 13 straits, spread across thousands of miles. This had never been done in the history of the world. It was thought impossible, ludicrous to even try. Half the signers of the Constitution thought that this was a mere experience and that soon America would come to her senses and select a proper king from Europe. You, my friends, are living in that experiment. It is now your experiment. Ladies and gentlemen, it has been an enormous pleasure. I look forward to seeing you again in another moment with Madison.